Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Rory Daly and I'm head of careers in LUMS. Um, today's workshop is about creating a winning CV. Uh, I am expecting more people to be joining us shortly online, but uh, we need to make a start because uh, we've quite a lot to get through. So I'm just going to uh, share some slides. Uh, if somebody could just shout out that you could see those slides, that'd be really helpful, please. Thank you, Mitch. That's very helpful. OK, so today's session is, is about creating a winning CV. And I'm also going to touch a little bit on a cover on creating a professional cover letter, which goes hand in hand with um, and creating a winning CV. So. By the end of today's session, I want you to be able to recognize what makes an effective CV. Understand what an employer is looking for when choosing between candidates while remembering that a CV is never going to get you a job. It's just going to be um, your possible entry into a application process. So your CV just basically gets you as far as the first stage interview. Able to think about what, a, what uh, how you can improve your own applications. And also, as I mentioned, we'll focus a little bit on what makes an effective cover letter. So a CV is your personal marketing document. It's the first thing that an employer is likely to see about you and it's your calling card. So it's really critical. It is the thing that will get you as far as the inter interview stage of an application process. So you need to make sure that it's professionally prepared, attractive to employers and tells them what you want them to know about you. So curriculum vitae is from the Latin, which means the course of life. So it's a description of you, your skills, your qualities, your experience, your awards, your academic performance up until this stage in your life. And the thing to remember is that some of you might be a bit concerned that you don't have a huge amount to put onto your CV. But the thing to remember is that most people are in the same boat at this stage. At this stage of your career, most CVs are quite light. Most people won't have had a huge amount of professional work experience, so it's critical that you start to think about um, how you can translate or how you can pre present the experiences that you've developed up until now or the skills that you've developed, how you can present those to an employer to make you a viable candidate. And everything we've done in our life up until now we can build on, we can develop from, we can take skills from. So don't worry so much if you feel that your, your curriculum is, a, your CV is a bit light yet at the moment. So it demonstrates to an employer that you're the ideal candidate for the job that you are applying for. And that last part is really important. So it's about the job that you're applying for. So a little bit of care needs to be taken to make sure that the CV that you're presenting is relevant to the job that you're applying to. And I'll give you some tips and techniques as to how you might go about doing that in a little while. So a good CV will stand out from the crowd in a positive way, open brackets, close brackets. I've seen some very, very bad CVs or some very uh, silly content on CVs, which would certainly help them stand out, but not in a positive way. It should be written with a specific job in mind. And by that, I don't mean that you should rewrite your CV every time you apply for a new job, but you should certainly be paying attention to what the employer is looking for when you read a job description or a person spec. You should definitely pay attention to what they're looking for and just reflect on your CV and think about how it applies to the job that you're applying to. So does the CV that you're presenting when an employer reads it, does it make sense to the employer that you've applied for the job? Can they see why you've applied for the job? It's generally two pages. Most, most graduate level roles will be a two page CV, except explicitly for finance, uh, for some FinTech roles and for some tech roles. But the vast majority, some technology roles, so the vast majority of CVs will be two pages. 
and it's to be clear and concise because you want to create a positive impression so that the employer will want to invite you to interview to find out more. And that also applies to the cover letter, which we'll touch on later on. But I always advise students to consider if you apply to, particularly if you apply to a graduate scheme with a, a Guardian top 300 company, the first shift of CVs will might be done automatically. The second shift of CVs will probably be done by relatively junior members of HR and their task is they've been tasked with their employer to whittle down maybe 100 CVs into 20 that they want to take forward. So you've got to make life easy for that junior member of HR, maybe a recent graduate, make it easy for them to put you into the yes pile. That's all we're trying to do. And the yes pile is the group that we move forward for psychometric tests or for an interview. So you want to be moved forward into that group. So make it easy for the person who's reviewing it. So there's no exact exact right way to um, to write a CV in the UK, but there are some things that you absolutely need to cover. So you need to cover your personal information, your career up to now, your qualifications, your employment history, relevant skills and achievements, and mention your references. And there are different types of CV for different purposes. So for our for the purpose of our conversation, we're focusing on what might be called a, a traditional CV or a skills based CV. If you're applying for um, postgraduate study or you are finishing postgraduate study and applying for an academic role, the CV is slightly different. And as I mentioned, a financial um, CV will generally be one page and much more focused and much more targeted. I should have mentioned as well at the beginning, you'll probably see on the screen that we are uh, recording this presentation, just so you're aware. Um, and apologies for not mentioning that at the very, very beginning. So this might seem really basic that you start with your name, but every year I review two or three CVs that a student has actually forgotten to put their name at the top of the CV. It's actually quite easily done. Um, because obviously you think, well, why would I put my name down? Because it is my CV, but, you know, obviously put your CV down, or your name down. Include your personal information. I would always advise a student to put their Lancaster address um, and Lancaster email if possible, um, and also a LinkedIn uh, um, uh, web link to their LinkedIn profile. Um, if you've got a good quality LinkedIn profile um, up and running. I strongly advise you to either use your Lancaster email address, because again, that signifies to an employer easily that you're in a, a, a top 20 university. Or use an email address that is a combination of your, your first name and your family name or vice versa. Um, but quite straightforward. I have seen students applying for jobs using email addresses like chocolate and vodka at hotmail.com. Not appropriate, um, not creating a good impression with employers, not professional. So stick to either the Lancaster email address or a very basic name, family name at Google or wherever else uh, in your personal information. Double check that your mobile phone number is correct. Very easy to type in um, a typo with your mobile phone number. And then if that's how an employer is reaching out to potential candidates, they're not going to try very hard if they've got lots and lots of applicants for a role and they're in your phone number and it's not correct. Um, they might try very hard to necessarily email you um, for the next stages. So I strongly recommend that after your name and and your contact details, you, you insert a short profile. So the profile serves three functions. So it's, it states who you are, basically 
what you have to offer, your skills, your experience, your interests. But it can also be an opportunity to say not just about why you want to apply for the job, but also what you could bring to the team or the organization. And also it gives the employer another hint that this isn't just a standard CV that you're sending out to every job that you apply to. They have taken a little bit of care and skill to personalize the email to make it relevant to the role that you're applying to. So in this case, a highly motivated multilingual student who relishes challenges and working under pressure, proven skills in working with and motivating others to achieve outputs, seeking an opportunity to further develop skills and gain experience in the fast moving consumer goods sector. So they've given a little bit about themselves. They're motivated, they're multilingual, they work well under pressure. If they look through their CV, you should see skills in working with and motivating others. And you're also telling them what your next step is in your career. And the important bit to remember here is we are only talking about the next step. So you're just talking about the next, whether it's a summer internship you're applying for, a placement, a graduate job. Even if it's a graduate job, you're only thinking about the next three to five years. You're not. Um, you're not tying yourself into one role or sector forever. So we are only talking about the next three to five years and employers are aware of that. So you then go on to talk about your education. So obviously you're studying in a top 20 university, so that puts you at an advantage. It stands out on your CV. So you start off with your university education, your degree or master's program title. You might then want to talk about relevant modules that you studied. So um, if you are studying marketing and you're applying for a digital marketing role, focus on the digital elements. Um, if you're applying for a fintech role, focus on, on the technology and the finance elements of the modules that you've studied. If you're an international student, you might want to talk about the studies that you've done in your home country and in the UK and elsewhere. But also if you've done some, if you're a UK student and you've done something like study abroad, also make sure you mention that. And then you might want to want to um, mention any live projects. So if you've done a lot of long students will have done management 200 or will have done student consultancy projects in their modules. If you've done one of those working with an employer um, either in a in the workplace or you've done a virtual internship as part of your studies, then focus and mention that as well. Highlight your academic achievements. So if you um, if you won an award for your studies or your your first two years suggest you might be on track for a first class degree, do mention that, but also mention your high school qualifications. So if it's the baccalaureate, for instance, the international baccalaureate, you might just me just mention the subjects and the grade that you got for them. Similarly for A levels, you don't need to say much more than that. Um, unless again you did something outstanding and you won an award or something similar for your grades at high school. And then particularly for UK students, you should mention your GCSE qualifications but along the lines of um, eight GCSEs, grades A to C, and then include if they're asking for a specific maths qualification, for instance, or you have a particularly notable achievement like all A stars, all A's, then mention that in your GCSEs as well. But you don't need to list every single subject that you studied for your GCSEs. So you should include all work experience, whether that's paid or unpaid. So you talk about the dates you were employed, the employer, and the job title that you had, your roles and responsibilities. But crucially, you've got to talk about what you actually did and what you achieved. So often students will just write down, I worked with in a factory um, and I uh, worked on the production line. 
well, what skills did you think you developed? What results did you achieve? There's always going to be something. So whether that's you developed your teamwork skills, you developed working under pressure skills, you developed good communication skills with your colleagues, whatever it might be, all work experience, you'll have developed some skills that will be interest to the employer. So make sure you think about that and make sure you reference it um, in your CV. And so for instance, then if you were, if you were working in a clothes shop and you um, helped redress the store window, for instance, what impact did that have? Did it improve footfall? Did it improve sales? Did you get positive feedback from the regional manager? Whatever it might have been, always think about when you put anything on your CV, think about, well, if somebody asks me to evidence this, how am I how am I going to, to do that? And that's really, really crucial because the employer wants to see what is the evidence for the thing that you say you're good at. So if you say you've got good leadership skills, where's the evidence for it? And always think about how you might give that evidence. So you should use bullet points and active language. So I mentioned earlier on that you talk about giving somebody detail of the things that you did. So use active language. So if you take the, the second bullet point there, so interviewed 70 elderly patients and obtained a substantial amount of data. Some students would just write interviewed patients in a hospital, but here you're telling the employer the number of patients that you interviewed and you obtained data that was useful. The last bullet point, you, you didn't just do a project, you completed the project three weeks ahead of schedule and you achieved a 2-1 grade for the project as well. So again, use active language, give evidence for your achievements and don't be afraid to promote yourself. Sometimes students are a little bit reluctant to sell their achievements. Actually applying for a, for a vacancy or a graduate job is one of the few times that we're allowed to promote ourselves, that we're allowed to sell our achievements. So don't be shy when it comes to telling a potential employer about what a good job that you did. I mentioned about using action words, so um, you'll get access to these slides and you'll be able to see these are really good words to use uh, when you're thinking about um, trying to describe your experiences working with an employer or um, your achievements from, from your academic studies. So one of the things to consider from, from creating your CV is that if we take the, the 16, 17 people on the call at the moment, basically your CV, the top half of your CV, or the first page of your CV, is going to look very, very similar. So you're going to have, you know, your name, address, contact details, a profile. You'll then describe your programme of study at Lancaster, then your high school, and then you may have some work experience. But often, you know, if lots of people have worked in 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 retailing or in the food and drink sector or similar work, the CVs are going to become very similar. So it's always good then to think about other things that you've done in the last year or two of high school and junior university life in particular, and think about other things that you've done that might impress the recruiter, but might also demonstrate to the recruiter that it's helped you develop skills that the employer is looking for. So I've given you two examples there of a social secretary for the basketball team, um, and somebody who organized a business quiz. So again, what you're doing, first of all, and how they're written as well in the additional skills sector, is you're flagging up to the employer what the skill is. So in the further skills section of a CV, I would always suggest that like that's on the screen, that you put the skill first and then explain how you develop the skill afterwards. So as the employer reads down the CV, they see these five, six, seven skills 
highlighted and they are skills hopefully that they're interested in or they've specifically asked for in the in the job description and person spec and you're helping them again think of that person reviewing all the cvs you're helping them see immediately that you're laying claim to the fact that you've got these skills and you're giving examples so always back up your skills with evidence throughout your cv but that's particularly important when we come to the additional skills and interest section because often students will put down just a list of i've got good communication skills good leadership skills good it skills with zero evidence and anybody could do that and the employer isn't going to take you at your word that you've got them because they've got so many other applicants who are giving them the detail so make sure you give evidence for all the claims on your CV, but also the additional skills and interest section is the part where you can stand out from the other applicants. So think about all the other things that you've done. So that could be playing sports, it could be volunteering, it could be playing a musical instrument, it could be doing drama, it could be in the cadets, it could be whatever it might be. Just think about all the other things you've done and where you might have developed those skills as well, because the employer isn't that concerned where you develop the skills. They're more interested in whether you have the skills. So whether you got the your leadership skills from being president of a student society or a summer internship, they're not that concerned as long as you can demonstrate that you've got that leadership skills, those leadership skills and you can give evidence for having those leadership skills, the employer will be very, very satisfied. Students often ask about um, putting down details of referees. Some people will advise you at the end of your CV to, um, to put down a bullet point that just says references on, upon request. I don't think it's actually necessary anymore because most employers will ask you for details of referees separately and they expect you to have references. So if you've got a, a line or two spare, by all means, you can put down uh, references available upon request, but it's not absolutely critical. But you definitely on your CV, you do not have to put down the name, address and contact details of a potential referee unless, unless the employer specifically requested you to include it on your CV. So just an example of a bad CV. So just think about you look at your are looking at it on the same screen. It's not to comment on the on necessarily on the content of the CV. Because that's not too bad, but a one page CV. Landscape. Doesn't look good, hard to read. It's going to be quite difficult for an employer. So what we're going to do is think about why CVs are rejected. So they're often rejected for poor spelling and grammar. Uh, we all make spelling mistakes, we all make typos, but most programs that we use pick up on the spelling mistakes. So there's very little reason for us to submit a CV that's got poor spelling in it. Grammar is slightly different. It's quite easy to make a grammatical mistake without actually realising. It's always a good idea to read back your CV in the same way as you read back um, an essay but perhaps ask a friend or a family member to read your CV and just see if they pick up on anything. Unprofessional presentation is probably the main reason why CVs are rejected. So employers just won't take the time to try and decipher a poorly formatted CV, a poorly presented CV. Um, try not to make it too fancy. Um, because that can also affect the formatting, etc. Um, the rejected is the content lacks re relevance to the role. And again, if your ability is not adequately evidenced, so you make claims to something, but you don't back them up with evidence. So research has shown that employers uh, spend on average 30 seconds looking at an individual CV. But actually a lot of employers will say within five to six seconds, they can tell you immediately whether a CV is going to be of interest. Certainly if when I'm recruiting to the management school, um, 
we have quite a step by step recruitment process, but my initial look at a CV would certainly not be more than a minute. And I can usually, usually make a, um, a good estimate of whether the candidate's going to be a strong candidate when I've spent one minute reading their CV. So you need to make the best first impression and be concise, relevant and well structured. So again, think of that person in a room who's sifting through 50, 60 CVs to whittle them down to 10 or 20. Think of that person. However you can make their life easier is only going to help you to get into that yes pile. So presentation is key. So two sample CVs there from Claire. Um, the one on the right has so many different things wrong with it. So in the UK, we definitely don't include um, uh, a mo we don't include a, a photograph. Uh, we don't need to write um, CV on the top of it because it's clear it's a CV. We certainly don't need to use the coloured font. Um, you definitely don't need to put down your date of birth or your nationality on a UK CV. Um, some employers, if you're an international student, some employers will want to know maybe about your right to work in the UK. And that can be something you can include on your CV if you have the right to work in the UK right at that time. But if you look on the one on the left, Claire's got her contact details underneath her name. Short profile, she started with her education. Given some examples of where she succeeded, given the basic details of her A-levels, given the basic details of her high school, and then has started with uh, some employment history. And again, um, has given some detail of the things that she has done, not just that I was a member of a society, but you know, evidence of the things that she'd done. And then you would carry on the CV like that as well, and then add uh, an additional skills section. So I hope you can see the difference between those two CVs and why one would be appealing to an employer and why one definitely would not. If you're applying for a job outside the UK, um, there are different approaches to CVs and different conventions. I'm not going to go into country by country, but if you go on to, up to, the, LUMS, to the LUMS or the University Careers Portal, through the careers Moodle pages, you'll find an, a site on international careers. And also within there, there's a, a site called Going Global, and it breaks down country by country, gives you a guide to working in individual countries, um, and it will tell you what the CV format looks like there. So do your research, find out what's required in the country, if you're in doubt, maybe you know a fellow student who's from that country and you might be able to ask them. But going global is, is where I would advise you to find most of your information. So some top tips just on the CVs. Please try and save your, your CV with your family name and your first name. C, the word or just the letter CV and then the date in year, month and day format. A, that would be really helpful for you because you'll keep track of iterations of your CV because you will change your CV as you do more things, you do more skills, you join more societies, you get more work experience. You will be changing um, your CV. So it's good to be able to keep track to make sure that you want to send um, that you send the right CV to an employer. Focus on your professional skills. So again, the skills that the employer is looking for, make sure that you're focusing on those skills. I mentioned earlier on about tailoring your CV for relevant roles. Again, you don't have to rewrite your whole CV, but maybe think about that profile or maybe think about the subjects that you want to highlight from your, from your degree or master's programme make them relevant to the role if they're relevant if you can to the role that you're applying to think of that person in the room make it easy for them to find the information that's needed 
And finally, on this one, you want to create a positive impression so that they will invite you to interview to find out more. And again, that's all the CV and cover letter are doing. So. Before moving on to the cover letter, just to recap. Think of the professional format. The professional look. Highlight your skills. Give evidence. And think about other aspects of your life outside of work if you need to develop and you need to promote the skills that you've developed. So it's about it's your whole life up until now. That's not just about work. It's not just about your academic studies. It's also about your pastimes, your hobbies, your clubs, your societies, whatever that might be. So most employers alongside the CV will also ask you for a cover letter. Excuse me. And to be clear, the CV a cover letter is not just a rewrite of your CV. The CV is the link between them, between your CV, the job description and you. And you need to think of what you can do for them, not what they can do for you. So the cover letter is your opportunity to create a powerful first impression. Highlighting what you think you can bring to the company. And it makes the employer want to read your CV. So it, before electronic submissions of applications, a cover letter was literally that it went into the envelope on top of your CV, introducing you and your CV. But just to reiterate, it's not a rewrite of your CV. So don't feel the need or the urge to include evidence on your CV in your cover letter. And I'll come on to that in a couple of minutes. So it's normally uh, the equivalent of one side of A4 in a Word document. Three to four to five paragraphs and I'll come on to those paragraphs in a couple of minutes. Clear structure. Again, using action words that we talked about when developing your CV. Make sure it's the same font and style as your CV. You want to look like a package. You want to look like a coherent package. And make sure you're as formal as is possible without being overly formal. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second as well. So. Your name and address on the top right hand side, all style formal letter. The company's name and address on the left hand side. Try your best. In fact, I would say try to avoid saying dear sir or madam. So. Often you'll be given the name of somebody to send the cover letter to that might just be somebody in HR. It's not necessarily the recruiting manager. If you've got a name, use the name. If you don't have a name. You might say dear HR team or something like this. Try to avoid saying dear sir or madam. A little bit of pedantic English language. You use yours faithfully if you don't know the name of the recruiter and yours sincerely if you do. Um, not too many people will pick you up on that, but some employers can be quite fussy about it. So just try to remember that one. Yours faithfully if you don't know the name. So if you haven't used the name in the Dear HR Team section, it's yours faithfully. And if you have, it's yours sincerely. You should also um, create an electronic signature. There are a number of ways you can do that online, including the very basic one of just writing out your signature, taking a photograph of it um, and editing the photograph and then including it in your in your letter. But there are a number of packages online that also allow you to create an electric signature or sorry, an electronic signature. So basically, um, your CV. Four main paragraphs. The first paragraph is. Who you are, what job you're applying for and where you saw it. So my name is Rory Daly. Um, I'm a, a postgraduate student at Lancaster University Management School studying accounting and finance. 
I'm applying for the, the role of finance intern, which I saw advertised on the university careers web pages. That's all that needs to be. But it's important that you do that because again, like the profile that you used, um, like the profile that you used at the start of your CV, it highlights to the employer that you may have written this letter just for this role and that you have done some research and that you're also already creating the right profile, that you're studying at the right university, you might be studying the right course and you're applying for a role that's relevant to everything that you're saying so far. So the first paragraph would be, why have you, why have you chosen this employer? So I'm, as I said on the screen there, I'm particularly interested in applying to Accenture because, so that might be because um, uh, Accenture have just opened a new section in their organization that you're really interested in, you want to work with them. It may be because Accenture are um, using the latest technology and this role will be involved in that and you're really excited about that. Uh, it may be because Accenture have a very good approach to equality, diversity and inclusion and that appeals to you and you want to work with an organisation that has that focus. It may be because Accenture have a focus on sustainability and that's something that you feel really passionately about and you'd like to work for an organisation that takes that equally seriously. If it's not because it they focus on, a, on something that you're really passionate about as an organisation. A simple trick is to go onto their website, find their news section or their press releases, and find a recent large scale development in the organisation that appeals to you and make reference to that. That will demonstrate you've done your research, but also um, in, show the employer that actually you're interested in where the organisation is going. Secondly, think about why you're applying to that particular service. Sorry, particular service line, department or role. So what was it about this role that really appealed to you? So if it's a graduate scheme, well, maybe it's the fact that it's a two year graduate scheme with a rotational element where you'll get to experience marketing, HR and and legal within the organisation. Maybe it's because it's a graduate scheme where um, you'll be offered a mentor. Maybe it's a graduate scheme where you'll have the opportunity to um, to work directly with clients. Whatever it is about that role, again, it's demonstrating to the employer that you've done the research about the role and it's specific about that role. So again, it's making evidence, demonstrating to the employer that you've taken the time to research this role. You haven't just fired off this cover letter to 20 other organisations, which by the way, all recruiters can spot when you've done that. It's abundantly clear. And I, as a recruiter, I wouldn't spend much time with somebody who did that if they couldn't take a little bit of time to um, focus on the role that I'm recruiting for. Why should I spend time focusing on, on their application? So why have you applied for this role? Second section. Then the third section. So why you? So what is it that you will bring to the organization? I would strongly say you summarize in one sentence who you are your education, your qualifications, etc. Maybe some work experience that you've had. And then I'd suggest that you draw the employer's attention to one thing on your CV or one uh, project or one internship or one placement that you've had that you think was of particular interest or particular relevance to the role. And you can make a line, something along the lines of, as you'll see from my CV, I spent three months working in a similar role with Unilever where I gained relevant experience in digital marketing to stick with that one, whatever it is that's relevant to the role. But don't give them your entire CV. So don't go, and I've also done this and I've also done that, 
because actually the cover letter is just supposed to make them want to read your CV, not to replace your CV. And if you give all the information on your CV, on your cover letter, they'll come to your CV and there's nothing new for them to read. So you'll have built them up with the cover letter. They go oh, really excited to see this person's CV and then they look at it and go, it's just basically the same as the cover letter and um, it can be disappointing for them. And then the final paragraph um, might refer to any relevant um, practical information either that they've asked for or that you think is relevant. So they may have asked for uh, uh, a full UK driving license. You might want to mention that or you might mention it on your CV, but they might also um, want to have known when you could start in the role. So you might want to say, um, my final exam is on the 3rd of July and I'll be available for any role from the 7th of July or the 10th of July, whatever it might be. And then you just finish off with, thank you very much for taking the time to read my application uh, and I look forward to hearing from you. And then sincerely, um, sincerely and, and your name. So the cover letters are a really good way again of demonstrating your research. It may be as well that you consider applying for a role that's not been advertised. So maybe a friend of yours or a family member says, oh, company down the road, I think they're interested in more people. I haven't seen the job advertised. Um, you could consider sending them what we call a speculative application. So that would be a, a CV. And obviously you would have to focus a little bit on the company rather than on specific roles if you didn't know about the roles. But the cover letter would be show your motivation and enthusiasm for the organisation, show why you're interested in the organisation, keep it brief and to the point. Sometimes employers, particularly smaller employers, won't be aware of, of what your skills are. So if you're a third year marketing student, many employers won't have an idea of what you could offer to the company. Or if you're a second year finance student, they'd have no idea how far on you are in your study. So maybe you need to make it clear for them. But keep it brief and to the point uh, and say that you're available for a chat. Now that's particularly relevant for the speculative cover letters, particularly relevant, as I said, for smaller organizations. Um, who might be glad of employing somebody, but don't necessarily have a vacancy advertised at the moment. So what makes a good cover letter? It's aimed at one job and employer. So again, you make it clear throughout the cover letter why you want to work for the organization and why you're interested in that role. It relates to the job description and the person spec. It shows motivation and enthusiasm. It's written in clear and accurate English. And again, it answers the question, why should I choose you? What can you offer our organization? And that's really critical um, for the employer. Again, reading through the CV or reading through the cover letter, they want to see what they what you can offer them, rather necessarily what they can offer you. And it should make the employer uh, want to meet you. So that's a quick run through CV and cover letters. I'm conscious of the time, so we'll try and keep to um, 10 to the hour. Please do have a look at the uh, careers information available on our website. Do book an appointment to see us through Careers Connect. If you want to start working on a CV there, if you go onto the careers portal through the Moodle page, there are plenty of resources available there that will help you create a CV. We'd then be very, very happy if you wish to, to book an appointment to come and see us, to come and talk about your CV, to come and review your CV. But the easiest way to have a conversation is for us to, for you to start working on a CV and then come along and book an appointment and have a chat with us. And as I said, you can book through all the appointments that are available on Careers Connect. So we've got a couple of minutes if 
uh, anybody has um, any questions. Um, I will do that. I'll put that connection through. Um, I'll put that link in the chat just when we're finished, Oliver, uh, where you can book on to our careers appointments and also get access to our um, to the careers information pages. But obviously, if you just go onto your Moodle list, you'll get the um, you'll get the, the link to the careers Moodle page and that will take you to where all the resources are about creating uh, your CVs, but also the international section where you can think about um, um, uh, the international approach if you want to have a look at going global, etc. Um, I, what I'll do is I will also share the slides in this, Jack, so you'll see the slides so you can have a look at that afterwards. Um, and if you only have a three months internship, would the CV work? I'm not sure what you mean by that, Mitch. Do you want to turn on your, your phone, microphone and ask? Hey, sir. Uh, what I mean is that I only got a three months internship, and is it need to written that under the employment section or or the career things? So you would include the internship in the career section, Mitch, and then focus on other aspects of things you've done at university, things you've done at high school, whether that was volunteering or sports or whatever that might be. As I said, most people don't have an awful lot of experience at this stage, so I wouldn't worry about that at all. Uh, I said, um, if you don't have the if you don't have the name, you could just say dear HR, dear HR partner, uh, dear recruiting team is also fine. Lalantorn, I can see you're just typing something there. Did you want to ask a question? So again, it's if you uh, Lalantor asks a good question about obviously you're applying for a part time job that's not directly connected with your studies, but again, the employer will be looking for particular skills that you might possess. So always look at the job description and the person spec, and they might be asking for communication skills, leadership skills, uh, team working skills, IT skills, marketing skills. All of those things you'll be able to. Um, able to have a um, uh, to be able to present in your CV and um, so you know some of you on here will be applying for part-time jobs working in retail or working in bars or working in nightclubs not necessarily related to your degree or where you want to go so um, don't worry about that at all um, I'm not sure La Lantern uh, I, I doubt that's just the reason for it but I'd be very happy to have a conversation with you about that if you wanted to book an appointment um, please feel free to follow up afterwards and we can arrange to have a chat about uh, you and your PhD uh, and getting a job very happy to have a discussion about that thank you okay thank you OK, so thank you very much, everybody. I will share these slides uh, in the chat in a minute or two. Um, please do book an, and the link to booking an appointment with us. Uh, please, please do keep in touch with us. We're very, very happy to review CVs. But once you've done that bit of work on the CV, OK? So. I see somebody else is typing there. Do you want to ask a question just before we finish? Asia? Do you want to ask a question? OK, thank you very much, everybody. I hope you have a, a good rest of the week. I'll share the slides in a couple of moments. Thank you very much for attending. Bye bye.